I'm going to be speaking today to Josh Ettinger, a PhD candidate at the University of Oxford and a co-author of the paper, What's Up with the Weather? Public Engagement with Extreme Event Attribution in the United Kingdom. It was recently published in the Journal of the American Meteorological Society. So welcome to the interview, Josh. Thanks very much for having me. Now, I think we should start this interview with a definition of extreme event attribution, if you don't mind. Sure. So it's a growing field in climate science. And apparent, uh, the way it works is essentially that um, climate scientists look at a specific weather event and using climate models, they try to assess to what extent did climate change influence the intensity and or the likelihood of that specific event. And that goes a bit further than some modeling techniques in the past, where it was more focused on broader definitions of relationships between weather and climate. So the new thing here is we can really talk about how a specific event was affected. Well, let's use an example. I'm, I'm not asking you to do an analysis here, but just uh, want to illustrate it for our viewers. So take the couple of months ago, of course, we all know that Texas was caught in a, a polar vortex. And I've seen a few uh, you know, media uh, explanations that climate change was responsible for the polar vortex dipping down into Texas, which it normally uh, doesn't do. Uh, is that the kind of thing we're talking about here? To a certain extent. So um, it, it gets quite complex. Um, I'm working for more of the communications and public engagement perspective. But if you speak to the climate scientists doing this, um, each kind of weather event has its own nuances, its own sort of levels of scientific uncertainty. So I know the polar vortex, for instance, had some debates between climate scientists about it. Um, but in general, we're trying to, yeah, uncover that relationship of what does climate change have to do with this specific event? And in what ways did climate change influence the factors or meteorological components of it? Right. Now, your paper is about communicating that relationship, and you did some focus groups. Can you tell me about the, uh, the results of the paper? Absolutely. So this, these extreme event attribution studies, or we can talk, that, talk about them as EEA studies or attribution studies, um, they've received a lot of attention in the media. And in terms of the scientific literature, they've been looked at um, in terms of their applications, primarily for climate change litigation, proving in court that climate change may have had a role, as well as um, for loss and damage mechanisms as part of the United Nations negotiations um, to determine responsibility. At the same time, a lot of people have talked about the public engagement value. You know, this could be a communication tool, but it's re received relatively little empirical testing. So that's what we sought to do. So essentially, we got some focus groups together online because of the coronavirus uh, last summer here in England, and we showed them the attribution findings. We talked to them about how it works, and we also provided some options for how we can communicate this, these findings, like the heat wave in the UK in the summer of 2019 was made four times more likely by climate change. How do people respond to that? So that's what we sought to find out. And through our analysis, um, we essentially looked at the opportunities and the challenges of communicating this. And we can get into more details, but essentially we found that EEA can be a useful communication tool, but there may be some nuances that are important to get across. Now, I want to run something past you. I've done a lot of writing about energy narrative because it, people in the industry, and it doesn't matter where, uh, whether it's hydrocarbons or electricity, you know, renewables, they often talk about energy literacy. If we could only get people to understand this particular form of energy better, they would, they would you know, make better decisions or be more supportive. And I don't, I don't hold with that. My argument is that energy narrative is really important. So you set out a broad narrative and then you tell stories that allow people to connect emotionally to that narrative. And eventually over time, you know, that's how you, you can change public opinion. Uh, it, would, would, that hold, would that thesis, that hypothesis hold up in this case? Absolutely. And I think the scientific evidence strongly supports the effectiveness of narratives as a communication device, because it's not just trying to provide one-sided information, but to really bring people along for a story and see themselves in that story. And certainly applies to energy. And with extreme events, a key finding of ours was the narrative of the event, the way you tell that story has a really important impact. 
are you just talking about the meteorological component, the actual weather event itself? Or are you also going to talk about the decision making on the ground, the preparedness, the other kinds of steps that you can take to adapt to these events? Um, so yeah, the story is, the narrative is really everything. So I know your paper uh, uh, provided some recommendations uh, for how to use uh, extreme event attribution. Can you tell us about those, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so as I was just saying before, it's thinking about the broader narrative of weather events. So it's not just the meteorological component, the climate change component. Um, that's obviously important, but we also need to acknowledge the human role on the ground in mitigating the losses, the damage, or even loss of life from these events. Um, so first thing is really making sure we're carefully telling the story of what determines vulnerability to extreme events. Now, something we also got into was communicating uncertainty in the science. There's, there's a lot out there, a lot of research and good research looking into how do we best communicate this. Um, we don't have the full answers for that, but we did find that it can be a challenge for people. It can, you know, instead of just giving the the final number, the heat wave is made four times more likely. If you say it's a best estimate of four of a range between this and that, people who don't have an expertise in this area start to get turned off. But that's really important information to the scientific process. So we have to find ways of balancing that. You know, I've, I've uh, struggled with this a little bit in uh, my climate uh, science reporting, we, and we do do some of that. Uh, and viewers who are interested can go to energy student resources and under the, uh, there's a climate science category. And one of the things I found that helps, and we'll see if you, uh, if you agree with this, is at the end of the interview, I ask the scientists, do you have high, low, or medium conf uh, confidence uh, in your results? And the scientists love that question because they will tell you why they have high confidence, but then they'll also often point out areas where they have, say, medium confidence, which means that they need to do more research, they need to get more data, those sorts of things. And I, I think, is that a good way to communicate this kind of information? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And there's lots of studies that really get into the details testing these language options. That's the way the IPCC communicates often with their findings um, with these levels. I think just a broad takeaway from our study, re regardless of what you're communicating about, using sort of jargon, avoiding jargon, I mean, and trying to just speak with regular words, low, high, medium is good, uh, p potentially better than some other kinds of terms that make it a little harder to detect, okay, what's the broad takeaway here? What is the scientist saying overall? Um, but at the same time, providing opportunities for those who wanna dig deeper into the science to enable them to do that. Josh, thank you very much for this. Uh, very interesting insights, really appreciate it. Sure, thanks.